Hello, and welcome back to History 1152. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the American West, some major political and economic trends in this region, and how these overarching issues played out for everyday people in the West. First, let's talk a little bit about what I mean when I am referring to the West. Americans across time have had different conceptions of what the West was. For example, in the years following the American Revolution, Americans referred to Ohio, Michigan, and the surrounding states as the Northwest, hence the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which banned slavery from any state in the region. Southerners on the eastern seaboard, in the years following the War of 1812, migrated to Mississippi and Louisiana, and referred to these states as the Southwest, so regional terms can be somewhat arbitrary. Because of this, I am going to define how I will be using the term the West. My definition of the West will include the states and territories that lie to the west of the Mississippi River. I have chosen to define the West in this manner because if you were to ask a person in the late 19th and early 20th century to define the American West, it would probably include all states west of the Mississippi as part of America's western region. To this day, we still have this attitude when we think of the United States. Demographers usually divide the country along the Mississippi River rather than at its center point, which is near Lebanon, Kansas. In terrestrial radio, the letter W on the first letter of a station's call letters designates that a radio station in question broadcasts from east of the Mississippi River, and the letter K denotes a station that lies west of the Mississippi. Consider Columbus's public radio station, WOSU, versus Los Angeles's public radio station, KCRW. Now, keep in mind this definition of the West, as all territory lying west of the Mississippi River will overlap with other regions, particularly the South. Most of Louisiana and all of Arkansas, Missouri, and Texas lie west of the Mississippi and are considered to be a part of the South because of the cultural, economic, and demographic similarities between these states and the traditional South, but they are also part of the West. I have no trouble defining these states as Western alongside other more traditionally recognized Western states because these states also share cultural, economic, and demographic similarities with the traditionally agreed upon far Western states like New Mexico and Arizona. So what I'm really trying to say here is that a region is bound by geographic features. The West is all land western of the Mississippi River, but a region is also defined by the cultural, economic, and demographic similarities of the population within, living within that space of land. With this terminology out of the way, let's talk about the factors that make the West the West. The American West, and most Americans' definitions of it, involve the West as being defined by frontiers. What is a frontier? The Oxford English Dictionary defines a frontier as the extreme limit of settled land beyond which lies wilderness, especially referring to the western U.S. before Pacific settlement. The OED also defines the frontier as the borderland between two nations or peoples. In a sense, both of these definitions are perfect for our discussion of the West as a place of frontiers. Most white Americans thought of the regions not settled by Euro-Americans as places that did not have the same level of civilization as the urban and integrated rural environments east of the Mississippi River. In the late 19th century, the West had a larger population of Native Americans than the East because the indigenous people of the West had not been as affected by the Euro-American expansion as the Indians of the East had. In addition, the U.S. government had encouraged or forced Eastern Native Americans to settle west of the Mississippi. The Native Americans, indigenous to the West, had lifeways that greatly differed from those of most white Americans, or even the Indians of the East. The Indians of the Great Plains, including the Sioux and the Comanche, adopted horses into their culture after their arrival in the 16th century, facilitating their semi-nomadic lifestyle based around bison hunting and the alternation of campsites. 
Native Americans of the desert southwest, including the pa Pueblo and the Navajo, lived in sedentary villages and practiced agriculture, although their growing techniques differ from those used by Europeans and the Native Americans of the east because of the southwest's arid climate. The adaptations that the indigenous peoples of the west had developed to deal with the region's unique opportunities and challenges were often puzzling to white Americans who arrived in the west, leading to strife and violence between these groups. Native Americans were not the only people of color who lived in the West before the large-scale arrival of white Americans. Mexican people lived throughout the Southwest, many of whom were mestizo, having mixed Spanish and Indian ancestry. Most lived in Cal California and what would become the states of Arizona and New Mexico. The United States gained control of these territories during its war with Mexico, fought from 1846 to 1848. The war ended with a U.S. victory, and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gave the United States control of the land that would become California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, as well as parts of Colorado. The treaty also affirmed the American claim that Texas's boundary extended to the Rio Grande, its present location. The debate over Texas's southern boundary had been a major reason for the U.S. and Mexico going to war. While there are many immediate reasons for why the U.S. and Mexico fought each other, a critical issue that informed the United States' stances in its disagreements with Mexico came from the belief in manifest destiny. Many of you have probably heard of the term manifest destiny before. It was popularized by the journalist John O'Sullivan, seen here, but it first appeared in an anonymous article that may have been written by the American journalist Jane Casneau. Manifest Destiny was a political philosophy that justified and encouraged American territorial expansion, essentially American imperialism. Manifest Destiny advocates used positive, almost religious language to define territorial expansion. They would have argued that the American empire would be an empire of liberty that would show the people of the old world and the newly independent Latin American nations how to be free. Manifest Destiny appealed to Americans of a variety of political backgrounds, but some of the loudest cries for Manifest Destiny often came from people who supported the expansion of slavery, and many of the people who opposed it did so on the grounds that the extension of American territory would inevitably lead to the expansion of slavery. Some supporters of Manifest Destiny, however, also supported the Free Soil Movement, which mandated that slavery not be permitted to expand into new territories, including John O'Sullivan, although his stance on slavery would change with the coming of the Civil War. John C. Calhoun, one of the most aggressively pro-slavery politicians in all of U.S. history, opposed the Mexican War and the territorial expansion that many believe would come from it because he did not think that Mexicans and Anglo-Americans could live peaceably together in the same country. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that Manifest Destiny was a complicated subject that often blurred political lines. The fact that Manifest Destiny could mean many things to many different people would lead to the term becoming popular again in the 1890s, a subject we shall discuss later. The language of Manifest Destiny would also inspire American expansionists to call for the acquisition of the Oregon country, what is now the states of Washington and Oregon as well as part of what is now British Columbia, all the way north to the 54th parallel. The British, conversely, claimed all of the territory to the 42nd parallel. Great Britain and the U.S. managed to make a deal without war, essentially dividing the territory at the 47th parallel, the present U.S.-Canadian border in the Pacific Northwest, although both empires came very close to fighting over this territory. Manifest Destiny not only informed how Americans viewed their nation's territorial expansions, but also how that land ought to be settled, developed, and ma governed. Manifest Destiny also impacted how Anglo-Americans thought people of color inhabiting the new American territorial acquisitions should be treated. Manifest Destiny maintained that the American people were special, and that their life ways, the patterns by which they lived, were the best. The living patterns of Native Americans, which included both agriculture and hunting on communal lands, 
were to be replaced by Anglo-American systems, which divide the land privately with the intention that family units would develop the land for agricultural use. The Homestead Act of 1862, one of the most important pieces of legislation in American history, encouraged the settlement of the West by private family units. Partially a wartime measure, the Homestead Act allowed all American citizens, both those born in the U.S. and naturalized immigrants who had never taken up arms against the Union, to claim plots of about 160 acres, settling on public land in the West, fulfilling the popular Anglo-American notion that America ought to be a nation peopled by independent farmers working small, comparatively, plots of land. Later versions of the act saw to it that women and African Americans were specifically mentioned as being included in the provisions of the act, allowing them to also gain land of their own. In many ways, the Homestead Act was a remarkably forward-thinking piece of legislation. It gave most Americans the chance to own land at no cost and gain upward mobility. Conversely, the act did have a dark side. The acts gave public land to homesteaders, land that had previously belonged to Native Americans. The settlement of Western lands by homesteaders would lead to friction between settlers, most of whom were white, and the Native American peoples who called the West home. Additionally, many people abused the generous provisions of the Homestead Act by pretending to be small farmers, when in fact they were actually speculators who planned on selling the land so they could sell it to large corporations, essentially, especially cattle raising and livestock companies. Homesteaders often used the land, especially in the Rocky Mountains, for mining and logging instead of agriculture, their intended purpose. Farming in the mountains was very difficult and requires additional acreage beyond the 160 allowed by the act to sustain a family. So homesteaders' decisions to cut down trees for a living is understandable. Unfortunately, the mining and logging practices used by homesteaders led to environmental degradation. Additionally, the discovery of precious metals would inspire an influx of prospectors and miners hoping to make it rich quick. Miners who were unable to get homesteads often squatted on Indian reservations, Native American territories that had been agreed to by Indian tribes and the U.S. government. The U.S. Army would try to remove these squatters to prevent Indians from attacking these illegal settlers, but the violence often escalated, leading to full-blown wars in which the U.S. Army would fight Native Americans. From 1876 to 1877, the Sioux fought the U.S. Army and settlers in an attempt to protect their reservations from squatter encroachment in the Black Hills of the Dakotas. Although the Sioux had been fighting the U.S. Army on and off since 1854. This war saw the Battle of Little Bighorn, in which the Sioux defeated the 7th Cavalry Regiment under command of the Civil War hero George Armstrong Custer. There were many reasons why the U.S. lost the battle, which would go on to be one of the worst defeats the U.S. Army experienced at the hands of Native Americans. One of the biggest issues was Custer divided his troops because he greatly underestimated the size and organization of the Sioux forces. Keep in mind, though, that these wars were never as simple as cowboys and Indians. The American military, as it had done since colonial times, frequently tried to ally itself with other Native American tribes. The wisest American military leaders recognized that Native Americans were not inferior savages, and that they could provide invaluable tactical assistance to their troops, especially by acting as guides, scouts, and hunters. Additionally, not all Native Americans were a single monolithic group. As I said before, Native Americans belonged to a variety of diverse tribal nations that, while often having similar life ways, also possessed many cultural differences, especially when it came to language. Consider, for example, during the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 1877, the U.S. Army employed Crow, Pawnee, and Eastern Shoshone warriors in their fight against the Lakota and the Dakota Sioux. The Crow in particular had been fighting the Sioux for years over territory in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The U.S. Army also welcomed Indians into its ranks, although it forced them to abide by Army regulations which were often at odds with Native American living patterns, 
and Indian soldiers often faced discrimination from their white com comrades and commanders. General Philip Sheridan, who fought in the Civil War and in the Indian Wars, is reported to have said that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Sheridan and military officers like him, including former Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman, if they did not want to see the Indians exterminated, wanted them to be defeated and confined to reservations. Native Americans who served in the U.S. Armed Forces may have also seen their service as a way to prove their equality to white Americans and gain the rights of citizenship, since the 14th Amendment did not automatically grant citizenship to Native Americans. African Americans took a similar approach to military service in the years following the Civil War. Black soldiers, called Buffalo Soldiers by some Native Americans, patrolled the West and took part in the Indian Wars. Ultimately, the Native American tribes of the West were not able to resist the military power of the federal government, backed in part by black and Indian soldiers, or the general American's belief in manifest destiny. Most remained confined to reservations, which shrank over time, and many elements of their culture declined, especially the life ways of the semi-nomadic Plains Indians, for whom the reservations were too small to provide adequate hunting land. The U.S. government also sent soldiers and settlers to hunt bison, the American buffalo, because the buffalo were a critical food source for many Native Americans, also weakening Indians' centuries-old hunting customs. Allotment along with Americanization had another goal. After all Native American family units had been given homesteads, excess land could be sold to white settlers. The Dawes Act also greatly weakened the power of Native American tribal governments as well. Ultimately, the Dawes Act, which promised to help Native Americans by giving them individual control of their land, led to the loss of nearly two-thirds of reservation territory to mostly white settlers, and it greatly weakened Native American tribal governments, leading to the decline of Native American culture on the reservations. In the late 1880s and early 1890s, the ghost dance movement became popular amongst members of the Lakota people. Followers of the ghost dance movement believed that Jesus Christ would return in the body of an Indian and white people would disappear from the plains, allowing the Lakota to return to their ancestral homelands, demonstrating a cultural syncretism between indigenous and Euro-American religious beliefs. The followers gathered together at Wounded Knee, South Dakota in December of 1890 under the watchful eye of U.S. troops. Partially to perform the ghost dance rituals, but also to mourn the death of Sitting Bull, who had been killed earlier that year by police who tried to arrest him for joining the ghost dance movement. The troops at Wounded Knee, who were part of the 7th Cavalry, the same unit that had been massacred at Little Bighorn 14 years before, attempted to disarm the Lakota worshipers. The details of what happened next have been debated for years but the disarmament ended with the soldiers firing on the Lakota worshippers, killing between 250 and 300, with only 25 deaths on the Army's side. Many of the American soldiers who participated in the battle at Wounded Knee regretted what happened, and they saw the engagement not so much as a battle, but as a massacre of Native Americans. Most scholars consider the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890 to be the last battle that the United States fought in its Indian Wars, as there was no organized battles between the U.S. Army and Native Americans after this point, although violence between unorganized whites and Indians would continue into the 20th century. Native Americans who were tribal members would not be granted U.S. citizenship until 1924. Nonetheless, Wounded Knee was the end of an era. Before 1890, the U.S. Army's primary mission had been to act as the nation's frontier constabulary, patrolling the borderlands between the United States, Mexico, Canada, and the Indian reservations. The regular U.S. Army spent most of its time on the frontier and relied on civilian volunteers and conscripts to fight the Civil War. The final dissolution of Native American military power allowed the U.S. Army to change its mission. The Army had established over 450 forts, posts, and installations across the West. With the end of Native American organized resistance, the Army began closing down its smaller posts and forts, 
and consolidating the troops and materiel into larger installations, like Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. This change allowed the Army to focus more on its time on training and professionalization rather than on frontier garrisoning and law enforcement. Additionally, the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which was initially passed to restrain the U.S. Army's power of law enforcement in the South, to prevent federal troops from being used to fight against white supremacist paramilitaries, also applied in the West, leading to the Army's change in objectives. Homesteading, manifest destiny, and the Indian Wars led to massive changes for the lives of the people who lived in the American West. We have talked about how life changed for Native Americans in the West, but we have not considered as much the other people who called the West home in the late 19th century. As I have said before, white Americans, enticed by the Homestead Act, migrated westward to take advantage of the free, supposedly open, and unoccupied lands of the West. Many of them were farmers, Many others worked as miners and loggers, expanding the resource extraction industry, providing raw materials that would fuel the industrial boom of the Gilded Age. Another important industry that helped to fuel America's industrial expansion was ranching. Ranchers and the livestock companies that backed them took advantage of the wide spaces of the Great Plains and the large herds of feral cattle to build the American beef industry we know today. Ranchers, with the help of herders called cowboys, would allow the cattle to subsist on the grasses of the plains, and then would organize roundups and drives to gather the cattle together, to take them to the cities where they would be slaughtered, and their meat could then be sold to feed the rapidly growing urban populations. The cowboys were a diverse group of people. Many of them were white, but many others were black, Native American, and Mexican. Ranching would provide steady employment for Indians, who had lost opportunity to hunt buffalo, African Americans fleeing the New South could have more opportunities for success out West than they would have had in the Southeast. The Cowboys also employed a mix of Anglo-American and Hispano-American methods to drive the cattle. Lassos in particular were used by Mexican vaqueros before they were adopted by American Cowboys. The Cowboys also created fashion adaptations, including the Cowboy Master or Boss of the Plain Hats, which were designed to help keep rain off the wearer's head, chaps, leather coverings to protect a horseman's trousers while he was riding through the underbrush, called chaparral, from which the coverings got their name. The cowboys also wore a new type of boot that had a higher heel and a slight point in the toe. This design allowed riders to more easily maintain their grip of the stirrup while lassoing a wayward doggy or calf. As important as the innovations used by the cowboys were, they would not have been able to sell the cattle they drove into the cities without railroads. The construction of railroads opened up the West from a variety of economic backgrounds. Before the railroads penetrated the West, westward migration was very expensive. Moving West required the purchase of wagons. The Conestoga covered wagons were a popular choice for family units moving westward. Poorer people, especially single men, often joined the army as a way of getting west, and often deserted once they reached their desired destination in the west. Some Americans also became cowboys, if they could afford a horse. The poorest Americans, who would have benefited the most from going west and establishing a homestead, could not overcome the logistical challenges of relocating westward. With the building of railroads, however, the financial barrier to going west was lowered. Now, anyone who could afford a train ticket could get to the West. The first transcontinental railroad, finished in 1869 at Promontory Point, Utah, Lake San Francisco, California, with Council Bluffs, Nebraska, allowing Americans to easily traverse the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, making westward travel and trade far easier and cheaper. The construction of these railroads across the West only made travel simpler and less expensive. The construction of these railroads also offered solid employment for a variety of workers, including Civil War veterans, immigrants, especially immigrants from Ireland and China, and African Americans, as stated before, who had come to view work on the railroad as a way to gain steady employment and the ability to move freely. Women also moved west with the railroads. They helped to build the Western service economy by running saloons, restaurants, hotels, 
laundries, and brothels that catered to the men who lived in the West. Women faced many challenges in moving to the West, but for many, life in the West offered more opportunities for self-employment and autonomy than living in the East did. Railroads also allowed goods and raw materials to be transferred between East and West far more quickly. Railroads could move timber and ores to the eastern cities, where they could be refined and manufactured into tools, firearms, and other equipment, which could then be sent west and sold. Additionally, the beef industry probably never would have taken off in the way it did without the growth of railroads. The cowboys could now drive their cattle to railheads in Texas and Oklahoma and load their cattle onto the trains, after which they were taken to rail hubs like Chicago, where they would be slaughtered and their meat sold. Americans have always had a taste for meat, and railroads made meat far cheaper and accessible to the poor. The development of refrigeration technology only increased the availability of meat and allowed Americans to eat flesh from creatures that had, been li that had lived and been slaughtered hundreds of miles from their dinner tables. Railroads helped Americans in the late 19th century reach the West far more quickly and easily, helping cities grow rapidly. Rail hubs like Denver, Colorado in particular grew as a result of these railroads. Towns that were bypassed by railroads, however, often constricted as their populations left to live closer to the rail lines. Some municipalities, especially those that were involved in resource extraction, became ghost towns when the mines ran out or all the trees had been cut down. So what was life like in these western towns? Life in these towns could be chaotic as people moved in and out looking for work. Violence, especially shootings, were common, although not out of pace with the violence that occurred at the same time in large urban areas. Law enforcement was stretched thin, and the U.S. Army was focused on safeguarding the frontier rather than law enforcement, which they would have been barred from anyway, thanks to posse comitatus. This environment allowed criminals and outlaws to make careers out of robbery. Men like Jesse James and William H. Bonney, better known as Billy the Kid, took advantage of the lack of law enforcement to make lives of crime. Both James and Bonney became folk heroes for many Americans for their resistance against law enforcement. James, who had fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War, became a hero for people who believed in the lost cause. Outlaws like Bonney and James seemed to be on their way out in the eyes of many Americans. Rather than being murderers and thieves, they were symbols, emblematic of the Wild West that was quickly coming under control of American civilization as a result of Manifest Destiny, the Homestead Act, the U.S. Army, and the railroads. While some Americans idolized outlaws, others chose to adulate more upstanding figures, like the performer William Buffalo Bill Cody or the crack shot sharpshooter Annie Oakley. These performers' skills in horseback riding and shooting had become entwined with the settlement of the West and were seen as symbols of progress for many Americans. Sitting Bull, the Lakota spiritual leader whose killing would help to inspire Wounded Knee, also performed with Cody. Ultimately, the forces of Manifest Destiny, homesteading, Indian Wars, and the railroads worked in conjunction to transform the West from a frontier in which people from a variety of ethnic back backgrounds vied for control to one in which the United States had ultimate hegemony. By 1890, the same year that the Wounded Knee Massacre happened, the U.S. Census Bureau declared that the frontier had been closed and that the American West had been fully integrated with the nation as a whole. The Bureau based this judgment on the fact that the entire continental U.S. had at least two people living on each square mile. This is hardly a high level of population density, but the analysts at the Census Bureau made this decision because they recognized the end of an era. Native American military power had been all but extinguished. Railroads cut across the prairies and mountain ranges of the west, and cowboys, miners, and loggers sent their raw materials back east, and eastern industrialists shipped their consumer goods west, fully integrating western markets into the U.S. economy as a whole. Looking at the control the U.S. had gained over the west, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner repopularized the term Manifest Destiny and created the Frontier Thesis in 1893. Turner posited that the struggle for westward expansion and integration had made the American people strong, vital, and democratic, and that with the West fully pacified, 
Americans needed to find new struggles and challenges to overcome in order to maintain their character and vitality. These struggles, though, will be the subject of a future video.